Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that is jumping on the Pete and Boss bandwagon. You need a lesson in being a man. Tuck in your shirts and then pull up your pants. Listen again if you misunderstand. What's that? I don't want to hear another pain. And now I'm going to have to live the rest of my internet life, hoping they don't have a milkshake duck moment coming. Why did it have to be septuagenarians who got me into drill rap? Let's get right into it. The Nike and Kobe partnership is done for now. After failing to come to terms on a new, possibly lifetime deal with the swoosh, Vanessa Bryant and the Kobe estate elected not to renew. Unless situations change over the next few weeks and months, the handful of Kobe 6 Pro Tros that were slated to drop, including the pop colorway, will be the last for a while. If you thought the resale price is repetitory and opportunistic already, it's likely to get worse. After news broke of the deal ending, the undefeated Kobe 5 What If pack that was reselling at an all-time low just a day before has started to climb back up as fans can no longer hope to get any new Nike Kobe's for a retail price. People are taking this news hard, man, especially those of a younger generation. For the kids who saw Kobe Bryant in his prime years, he was a Nike guy. Hundreds, if not thousands of those kids who grew up to play basketball in college and in the pros were Nike Kobe's because he was their idol. The Adidas era doesn't even register to them. And even though Mamba won more championships in the three stripes than he did with the swoosh, it's like a bad dream or something. But it was real, and it should be taken into account when thinking about Kobe's legacy in the sneaker world. He didn't just start wearing low-cut shoes and that was it. Nah, he revitalized Adidas basketball in the 90s and gave the brand an edge and a star it didn't have since the days of another famous Laker, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The Adidas Kobe, which we now know as the Crazy Eight, was an iconic silhouette to those who grew up in the 90s. Derrick Rose famously wore a red pair, breaking from his own burgeoning signature line at the time because of his fondness for the shoes and Kobe. During the three-peat era, people remembered the audacious Adidas Kobe one, the one was spelled out, that looked like the three stripes answer to the phone posit. But maybe the shoe that people remember the most from the Kobe and Adidas era is the Kobe two, AKA the submarine shoes, AKA the consensus as the worst signature shoe of all time. That didn't sit well with Mamba and combined with the lackluster sales or at least sales that were on par with his stature in the game, he bought out his Adidas contract and began the path that would lead him to Nike. Flash forward to late last year and the story breaks that prior to his passing, Kobe was laying the groundwork to start his own Mamba brand because he was dissatisfied. What could he be dissatisfied with, you might ask? I don't know. Do you remember what the Nike Kobe 80 NXT Fast Fit looked like? Maybe that might give you a hint. And don't let these obscene resale prices for the Kobe Pro Trolls today fool you. The Kobe 4s and 5s might be the favorite of NBA players, but you could find Kobe 1 Pro Trolls at the outlet store. You could find the Kobe 4 Pro Troll Draft Day sitting in House of Hoops installations for weeks, and despite selling out on sneakers, the Kobe 5 Pro Troll Chaos was not that hard to find in stores. I even remember thinking to myself, huh, maybe those Chaos Pro Trolls will actually go on sale. But that wasn't meant to be. Having been a fan of Kobe for all of his NBA career and being around his sphere of influence in Los Angeles, I can understand Kobe wanting out. He wants his ADs to be given the new Air Jordan treatment. He wants his Pro Tros to sell out and be celebrated in the same vein as Jordan Retros. He wants his takedown shoes like the Phenomenon and Mamba Fury to be widely available to those who can't afford the canonical signature line. And most importantly, he wants shoes in kid sizes and baby sizes so the next generation will grow up rocking with him. He was thinking about the big picture. He wanted a Mamba brand, and maybe Nike didn't see things the same way. Who knows what kind of calculations Nike made, but if Kobe was willing to take meetings with outside groups, it probably means that they did not see the Mamba brand as being worth the same level of investment as a Jordan brand. And without that level of commitment, I can see why Vanessa and the estate took a page out of Kobe's playbook. It's not like he didn't do this before. So where does the story go from here? Well, there could be a reconciliation and realization on both sides, partnering up because it's in their collective best interest. Like I said before, there are now generations of kids growing up who only know Kobe as a Nike guy and Nike as the only company that makes Kobe shoes. Anything else would feel incomplete. That's why a Mamba brand without Nike's backing would be an incredible risk. First of all, not having the man himself to promote and champion the brand would be a monumental challenge. You are basically relying on his fans to support and prop up the brand. 
I feel like that would work from an apparel and gear standpoint. I mean, I'm ready to buy any and all merch with that Mamba logo, but it's a different story when it comes to shoes. Few athletes have left the Nike walled garden and gone on to achieve similar or greater success. I mean, it's basically Roger Federer and Kanye West. Kevin Garnett and Chris Webber have bounced to every sneaker brand known, and yet we still think of them for their early days as Nike guys. Deion Sanders has been with Under Armour for years now, and he is as popular as it gets in the football world, but we only care about his Nike trainers. Kobe's stature relative to his sport and to the world is on a different level than the names I mentioned, but we'll have to see if it's enough to overcome not having a swoosh. There won't be ballers like DeMar DeRozan and Devin Booker and John Morant and Sabrina Inescu and Jewel Lloyd to wear Mamba brand because they have Nike contracts. And maybe most importantly, these hypothetical Mamba brand shoes will not have Kobe Bryant's input. And for me, that was half of the fun whenever a new Nike Kobe would drop. You would get the stories of Kobe and Eric Avar working stupid late hours thinking of concepts and designs and technologies for the shoe. There would be the commercial that Kobe was so proud of putting together because it allowed him to flex his creative muscles. Whether the finished product was great or not, at least when it came to the shoes that he wore during his playing days, you knew that it was something he spent a lot of time developing and creating and perfecting. If I were to predict what the future holds for a Mamba brand, ironically, I think I might see a team up with a familiar face or at least get him some advice from him. Shaquille O'Neal is a unique force in the sneaker world. On one side, he's got an amazing legacy with Reebok that resonates to this day whenever they retro the OG Shaq attack and Shaq Gnosis. On the other side, he's got a discount shoe brand that sells in the millions to underprivileged kids who can't afford a Nike signature product. Maybe we see a Mamba brand team up with Shaq to bridge the gap in creating high quality, high performance basketball shoes on the level of a Nike Mamba Fury and sell it at Walmart. At the same time, the Mamba brand could release top of the line basketball shoes and sell them at unconventional locations because convincing Foot Locker or Finish Line to make room for a new brand might be a huge ask, at least at the start. Eventually, Nike, or maybe even Adidas comes back into the picture and sees the value that we have seen all along. What I don't see is Vanessa and the Kobe estate staying on the sidelines. The Mamba brand will happen. It's just a matter of when and how. It's the Heat Check, where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. First of all, let's get all of the shoes that have been delayed out of the way. We have the Nike LeBron Air Max 95 Home Team on the 26th for 170, the Nike Dunk Low Women's Green Glow on the 27th for $100, the Nike Dunk Low Photon on Dust, that's women's as well on the 27th for $100, the LeBron 8 Blue and Orange on April 28th for $200. And let's just hope that these actually drop this time, but seriously, no promises, guys. We have the Adidas Ultra Boost 6.0 on the 27th from 180. After seemingly leaving their past behind with the Ultra Boost 2020 and 21, looks like it's back to the basics with the 6.0, but with some major changes, so it's not just a retro. The first of these changes is a prime blue upper, which uses Parley Ocean Plastic. The second is the caging and counters that use Milgard Ocean Sea, a polymer blend made from reprocessed plastic and old fishing nets. And finally, the Boost has a lower profile compared to the Ultra Boost 2021. Next up, we have the Simpsons Adidas Superstar Squishy. This is on the 28th. Hum, we get sneaker tributes to the Squishy and the Arnold Palmer in the same week. Funny how that works out. Anyways, the famous Quickie Mart beverage is part of the larger Simpsons and Adidas collaboration, but don't order the all syrup version or you might be on a bender like Bart or Millhouse did. We have the Air Jordan 4 University Blue on the 28th for $200. This one is for the 90s fans with the little nods to the classic champ sports ad where Michael Jordan was rocking his college uniform that came with the iconic Nike laundry tag. Oh wait, I just got word that this is not for the 90s fans and that hype beasts are offended that I wouldn't include them. And even though most of them are just gonna put these up on the gram and then resell them a week later. No, I'm not bitter that I'm going to miss out on these. Why would you actually ask that? That's rude. Then we have the Nike Dunk High Court Purple on the 29th for $110. I'm just gonna read the description on sneakers. Taking after an iconic franchise in Los Angeles, this team-themed edition uses ornate embroidery to mimic classic basketball caps. They had me at iconic. We have the Sakai Nike Vapor Waffle Sesame and Blue Void on the 29th for $180. And then we have the Sakai Nike Vapor Waffle Dark Iris on the 29th for $180. The next wave of Vapor Waffles have arrived and I anticipate no problem grabbing a pair of these. Nope, no problems whatsoever trying to pick up this colorway that looks like something out of a J. Crew catalog. And I bet we'll even see Devin Booker or Chris Paul featured in these for league fits if it hasn't already happened by the time you watch this. Uh, we also have the Travis Scott Air Jordan 6 British Khaki. These are on the 30th for $190. <laughs> These are gonna get delayed. 
Uh, we have the Nike Go Flyies on April 30th for 120. After a limited release last month, the Go Flyies gets a wider drop to close out the month that will hopefully wreck their resale price. If there's a shoe Nike should just make more of and flood the market with, it's this one. Billionaire Boys Club, Reebok Instapump Fury Boost, Earth and Water on the 30th for $200. The elemental vibes are strong with this two sneaker pack. That gives the Instapump some earthy and wavy tones depending on whether you go for the dandy blue or pine green colorway. I have to say though, their promotional images of the shoes have got a lot of Death Stranding vibes and that's not a compliment. The game was weird, yo. Then we have the Air Jordan 13 Red Flint on May 1st for $190. My co-writer, the real one despises the Air Jordan 13. He thinks the overlays look like slabs of meat slapped onto the upper and he doesn't want his feet to look like a walking Ruth Chris. However, he hates the original Flint 13s the least, so maybe this red Flint player will get him to change his mind. And then my pick of the week is the Nike LeBron 18 Low Summer Refresh on the 30th for 160. Also colloquially known as the LeBron Palmer, this unofficial homage to the king of golf and his beverage concoction is a neat summer sneaker that I wish also had a Nike golf version. Can you imagine rolling up to the driving range rock these? Actually, I can because I would do it while sipping on some tea and lemonade. And now for a heat check on the Phoenix Suns, most notably Chris Paul. I'll be honest, keeping up with this NBA season has been a drag. Sure, NBA Twitter is always popping with crazy stories on the daily. Shout out to Vivian with an E or whoever that is. And there have been flashes of brilliance between MVP frontrunners Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid. Not to mention the current scoring chair that Steph Curry has been on that's giving people plenty of 2005 Kobe vibes, but it's still not the same. Is it because my 17-time world champion Los Angeles Lakers have been in a rut and my guys LeBron and Anthony Davis have been sidelined with injuries? Well, yeah, but it's more than that. Okay, I'm lying. It's like 95% that. But they're not the only stars that have been sidelined with injuries or held back because of COVID protocols. Hopefully, when the playoffs start in a few weeks with the playing games, my interest will kick back up again. If the injuries and setbacks for my Lakers last until the postseason and cost us a chance to add to our ring collection, I'll be bummed for sure. But I wouldn't mind seeing the Suns come out of the West if that's the case. What? Did you think I was going to root for Pandemic P? Psh, please. Like I mentioned in the previous episode, I have nothing but the utmost respect for guys like CP3, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, and Jamal Crawford. I just root for them more now that they aren't with that other team. And judging from the standings, which I looked at for the first time since All-Star, the Suns are right there fighting for that top seed in the West. I was shocked to be honest, but then again, maybe I shouldn't have been because they've got the point guard. Ever since he left Los Angeles, Chris Paul has been proving to everybody that he's not even close to being washed. In Houston, he was an injury away from beating Steph KD and the Warriors in the West Finals. In Oklahoma City, he led a bunch of kids to the fifth seed. And now in Phoenix, he gets to play with a bona fide star in Devin Booker, a former number one pick in DeAndre Ayton, and a solid core of young players and veterans. Most outsiders probably thought a pass as prime CP3 was coming there just to give them a slight push forward. Forward. Instead, they got a kick in the ass with Chris. But that was always the thing with Chris. He cares. Maybe a little too much. When he first came to Los Angeles, well, the second time because he was supposed to go to the Lakers first, but we got screwed and sorry. When Chris played for that other team, he actually believed he could turn that franchise around and make Los Angeles a two-team town. He made the media rounds, held countless events, popped up in numerous charity endeavors, hoping against hope he could make his team relevant. And it worked for him. Chris will always have a place here in LA. Sure, he'd probably be an icon with a statue outside of Staples if he was actually traded to the Lakers in 2011, but it's fine, really, it's fine. And I got love for Phoenix, hell, I hosted an event for them a few years back and would love to do it again in the future as we get closer and closer to being normal again. For the 90s teams with Charles Barkley to backcourt 2000 with Jason Kidd and Penny Hardaway to the Steve Nash era with Amari and Sean Marion, I got nothing but respect for the Suns and hope they do well. If LeBron and AD can't shake their injuries and my Lakers get eliminated from the playoffs. But if the Lakers and Sun meet in the playoffs, I give my rooting interest in Chris Paul and the Phoenix Suns seven CP3 dunks over Dwight Howard out of 10 Paul Gasol head rubs. Man, CP hated that. Ah, good times. All right, it's time for this week's Hard Pass where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go like my take a few weeks ago on the Jordan Zion 1, previously known as the Jordan Z Code. The Z Code was probably some internal nickname anyways, but anyway, seeing the Zion 1 in a variety of colorways has turned me into a believer. This is the part where I shamelessly plug my unboxing video of the Zion 1, but I do think the kid has the ability to do what other Jordan brand athletes with signature shoes have not been able to do, and that's transcend the Jumpman. 
There's a gift and a curse to being a Jordan brand athlete. You get to rep the brand of the GOAT and never have to worry about taking L's on sneakers ever again. But if you want to make a name for yourself in the shoe game, good luck getting people to see past that logo. But with Zion becoming the brand's first Gen Z signature shoe athlete and most Gen Zers not giving a shit about Michael Jordan besides the clout issues give them, we could be on the precipice of something really special. So this week's actual hard pass, well, it goes to losing the thread. This past week, the world heard the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial for the murder of George Floyd. It went the way it should have went. Guilty on all three charges of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. In a vacuum, there shouldn't have been any doubt. When a man dies because a police officer kneels on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds, and that man is handcuffed and harmless and saying he can't breathe, that's murder. But because this is the United States of America, you just don't know sometimes. Actually, you do know, because there have been murderers like Derek Chauvin before, and there have been victims like George Floyd before, and the murderers get away with it. If it wasn't for a brave teenager filming Floyd's murder with the complicity of Chauvin's partners, we would have no choice but to assume that the initial statement by the Minneapolis Police Department was the truth. The title says, man dies after medical incident during police interaction. Like, what? Two officers arrived and located the suspect, a male believed to be in his 40s, in his car. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted to be appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center where he died a short time later. At no times were any weapons of any type used by anyone involved in this incident. No mention of an officer slowly killing the alleged suspect or that there were witnesses to see that horrific scene. And it also looks like we're gonna have to expand our definition of the word weapons to include knees. Man, but look at that statement again. Without the video, we wouldn't know George Floyd's name and the horror he experienced before dying. The only way we'd have heard of him is if his friend Steven Jackson mentioned it on his Instagram talking about losing a brother. And knowing how we use social media, our response would have been either a like a pithy comment on condolence, or we just scroll through it, not giving it another thought. Of course, we can talk about justice being served, but really, this is merely one case of the system working as it was intended to work. But because it doesn't always work as it's intended to work, there has to be change. Real justice is George Floyd being alive today to be with his daughter. We can't forget that. We can't lose the thread. We can't get caught up in the BS that one side spews and we can't be consumed by the unforced errors that we will inevitably make. When the Las Vegas Raiders Twitter account tweets out, I can breathe, we have to accept that when corporations or sports teams are trying to figure out how to sound like a compassionate human being, they are going to stumble like this. In fact, I actually appreciate Raiders owner Mark Davis stepping up and owning the tweet instead of throwing their social media manager under the bus. Leaving it as a pin tweet? is a bit excessive, but we have to move past it and hope that the team will be an ally moving forward. If Nancy Pelosi thanks George Floyd for sacrificing his life for justice, we call it out and wonder why she thinks Floyd chose to die for justice. But after the podcasts are recorded, the think pieces are written, and the cloud is collected from chastising her, we have to pressure her in Congress to change the system. When LeBron James posts a tweet asking for accountability in the death of a 16-year-old black girl named Makia Bryant from the gun of a police officer mere minutes after Chauvin's conviction was announced, we can't get into arguments with clowns with agendas. Like, could LeBron avoided this with a more nuanced tweet? Absolutely. But let's not pretend like idiots with Twitter handles that have eight or nine numbers in them are arguing in good faith. I bet you most of them mention China for no good reason. They're either bots or losers who burn their Nike socks for likes and buy a new pair the next day because they burn their good socks. Don't lose focus. Hope LeBron learns from this. Find out the facts in Bryant's case and question why it was necessary for her to die. Knife or not. And keep pushing. Not because this is what George Floyd would have wanted, because we don't actually know George Floyd. And because people are going to use and bastardize his name to fit their agenda, we can't lose the thread because the change to the system... That's what America needs. All right, that's gonna do it for the show. Thank you for watching Hard Pass. I'm Jacques Slade. I'm gonna play MLB The Show, a PlayStation exclusive franchise for like forever on my Xbox Series X. Shout out to Game Pass. It's a sentence I never thought I'd say in 2021. But before I go, I'd like to show you the OG video game crossover, Mario and Sonic. <laughs>
you kids will have no idea how wild it was to see Sonic show up on a Nintendo GameCube for the first time. I'll see you guys next week. Peace.